Welcome to another edition of Believe in Giants. Bob Papa, two-time Super Bowl champion Carl Banks. The Giants with a big road win in Seattle against the Seahawks. 29 to 20 on Sunday. And it's time for the happy recap. And Carl, um, <laughs> listen, I don't think anybody looking at this game thought that the Giants were going to win it, you know, from the outside. Mm -hmm. And I know that nobody thought that the Giants could dominate the game the way they did. And uh, Brian Dable called a masterpiece of a game. Shane Bowen had all the answers. Yeah. But typical Giant win, you know, it comes down to a block field goal at the end of regulation, return for a touchdown to avoid going to overtime. But uh, this was another good performance by this football team, and they found a way to win a game that they found a way to lose against Washington and Dallas. Correct. That is correct. Um, yeah, I mean, my theme for this team, and I'll say it every single week, is the best players have to be the best players, regardless – of who they're playing. And yesterday was, it was evident that the best players were the best players against um, this, this Seahawks team. Um, Deontay Banks accepted the challenge that uh, his coaches gave him. Uh, DK Metcalf was not a factor in the game. I think he had like four catches, but um, he was not, effective at all. Deontay Banks create uh forced to fumble, had a, a PBU uh while guarding Metcalf. So it was great. Um Dexter Lawrence, you can't say enough about um Spider-Man, Brian Burns, big impact plays. Kayvon Thibodeau is now he's become he's becoming consistently good. And when I say that, or I should say consistently impactful, um, every game he's making plays. Um, he's in the backfield. He's been very disruptive. And because it's not the flash stuff, people tend to overlook or not see some of the things he's doing, but he's been impactful every single game uh, with the exception of that um, that Minnesota game. Good to see that. Good to see um, Cordell Flott, another solid game for him. And this is, you know, this is why the guys up front can have the success that they are having and the guys behind them are having their success. That's just the, 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 the um, defensive side of the football. I think the credit goes, and we talked about this, uh, in our preview, it starts up front with the Giants' offensive line. We knew that they could pass block. Um, they've been doing that all year. They didn't run the ball well against the Cowboys. They didn't run the ball effectively at all. They bounced back this week against a good team, and they ran it for over 100 yards. And that's as complete of a win as you're going to get in it. In it enabled the quarterback to really operate at a very high level yesterday. So um, those are all the good, the feel good parts of it. Um, really happy to see uh, Isaiah Simmons contribute. I mean, he's, he's a freakish athlete anyway, but the fact that he was able to close this game out with a field goal block, it just speaks to, the resiliency of this giant football team, uh, their ability to persevere because they went down by seven again early in the game. And then the first play of the Giants offense, Daniel Jones stumbles. And then, you know, I'm sure people are like, oh, what is going on here? Here we go again. Stumble, fumble. Um, and Andrew Thomas falls on the ball and he didn't, he didn't stumble on his own. He tripped over Thomas's foot, but then they got back on track and they dominated offensively time of possession. I believe, correct me if I'm wrong. The Seahawks had one drive outside of the two minute warning. Yeah. The entire I mean, first half. 
they had, uh, you know, you, you take a look at the first quarter. They got one first down, then they punted. So they had the ball then, and the Giants went on a 10-minute drive. Of course, Gray fumbles, and Rashawn Jenkins goes 102. Then the Giants um, punted on the final play of the first quarter. Seahawks go three and out, and then the Giants go on another – four minute and 26 second drive ending with a, you know, a Sean Robinson touchdown. So the giants have had the ball for basically the first quarter and a half and it's seven, seven. Mm -hmm. It was such a yeah. crazy, such a crazy game. And then the giants, you know, Seattle gets a couple first downs. They punt end of the half. The giants are moving the ball. And, uh, you know, with 29 seconds to go in the half, one L Robinson with another drop, so the Giants kick a field goal to go up 10-7. But if he doesn't drop it, they either have a chance for a touchdown or they kick a field goal and there's no time left on the clock sure. for Seattle to tie the game up at the half. It was the most bizarre 10-10 score at halftime I've ever seen. And I'm sure Seattle went into the locker room and their coaches had to be saying, it can't be any worse for us. Yeah. And it's tied. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you're right. So let, let's kind of address the elephant in the room, if you will, as it, re as it relates to this game and prior games, the ball hitting the turf from these wide receivers. They lead the NFL and drop passes. Let me just, let me just explain this folks. Um, and this is how opposing teams look at it. They'll look at Wondell Robinson and they will say, oh, he has a tendency to drop balls. That was probably the first two games. Now he's trending. He's five games in. Now he's trending. It's a known fact that he's going to drop footballs. Um, Darius Slayton, they're going to say really fast, really good. Uh, wide receiver, but will drop a few, right? This is the difference against, and they, they beat a good team yesterday, but burying a good team and making a statement, you've got to, you can't let the ball hit the turf when the quarterback's on target. Um, I think he may have had one Aaron throw, um, Daniel Jones, Everything else was in the catch radius of these receivers. And, you know, they're not going to be perfect throws because there are factors in the game that won't allow the quarterback to put it picture perfect. But if it's in your catch radius, then you're a starting receiver. You've got to catch it. Now, I'm not saying this like these kids don't care. I know it's important to Darius Slayton. I know it's important to Wondell Robinson. But to say it's important and not execute week after week, you've got to go from important to priority. Um, things happen fast in the game. You, you know, look, Slayton had a big, big touchdown. He had big catch down the sidelines in which we'll get into, you know, the theory that the quarterback couldn't throw the deep ball. looks like he's got that calibrated now. Um, but if you want to be the team that can put 30, 40 points on the board, you can't let footballs hit the ground. And I'm going to make a comparison because he was once their teammate. And I'm not, again, I'm not crapping on these guys because I think it is important to them. I think they do care, but they have to make it a priority. Sterling Shepard was a guy who never wanted the ball to hit the ground. And uh, even Saquon Barkley, who never wanted to fumble. Like, you have to have that mentality, and it has to become a priority to you. If you're if you're a guy who has to catch footballs or you have to carry the football, your priority is not to let it hit the ground. If it's within your radius to catch it, you've got to make those plays. Because, number one, your numbers go up. Number two, your quarterback looks even better than he has during the course of the game and nobody blames you, but now you're in everyone's scouting report. Wondell Robinson, shifty guy, short area quickness, 
can catch and run, but will drop a couple every game. Darius Slayton, consistent receiver, but will drop one a game. I mean, if you look at the film, every game they've had a drop. And if that ball is in your catch radius, again, I think they do care. I think it's important to them. But it has to become priority. It has to be a sense of pride. I can't let this ball hit the ground. I can't let my, my quarterback down when we're driving ready to bury these guys and you don't, and then you kind of keep them in the game. Like if you want to send a message, if, if you really want to serve notice on the league of what type of offense you are, because you got some really good plays, you got a really good play caller. If you want to serve notice on the league of what type of offense you are, don't let those footballs hit the ground and people will start to sit up and take notice because you're wide open, you're open, your quarterback is operating really well and you're dropping balls and you're letting teams stay in the game where these could be touchdowns, touchdowns or field goals, field goals. And your, your opponent, the way you're dominating on the other side of the football and the way you're operating on offense you could demoralize some really good football teams if you don't let the football hit the ground. Folks, Bet Online is the world's most trusted betting platform, your number one source for everything football. Bet Online is every stat, matchup, even live odds and spreads to bet on during the game. Think you know your stuff? Get in on $200,000 mega contests, pick six games against the spread every week, your chance at weekly prizes and a share of $200,000. When the game's over, Head on over to the online casino. Get in on the game of blackjack or poker. They have over 150 slot games. Head to the website today to get in on the action. Bet online. The game starts here. Carl, um, you know, a lot of winning plays in this football game. And I'll, mm-hmm. I'll take you to the third quarter. So the Giants have dominated this game, but it's 10-10. They get the ball to start the third. And Wandell Robinson has another drop on a third and five. So the Giants go three and out. And Geno hooks up with Tyler Lockett for 33 yards. So they're at the Giant 38. They they only gave the ball to Walker for runs twice in the first half. And he had two carries for two yards. He rips off a seven-yarder. So now it's first and 10, uh, second and three at the Giant 31. And uh, Smith hits Metcalf for 10 yards. Okereke gets in there to tackle him. And Tay Banks gets in there to tackle him. And Banks rips the football out. Now, look, Captain Obvious, Mm -hmm. Isaiah Simmons blocking the field goal and Bryce Ford Wheaton returning it for a touchdown to ice the game as opposed to potentially going to overtime turns out to be the play of the game. But this was a very important play because they're driving. They hadn't really moved the ball at all on you. Mm -hmm. You're coming off yet another drop that kills a drive. And then the giants go four plays, 77 yards. You get the 41 yard pass on first and 10 to Slayton. You wind up getting the deep over the 30 yard touchdown, which by the way, as Dable said after the game was the second read as opposed to, this segment of Giants fans that say that Daniel Jones only makes one read, which is mm. not true. Um, but to me, the Tay Banks forced fumble because the Giants conceivably could have gone down in this game 13 to 10 or 17 to 10, despite the fact that they had dominated the game because another drop pass was mm-hmm. cir- you know, short circuiting them. And you knew eventually Seattle's offense would have to get going. This is a team that averages almost 26 points a game on offense. Sure, sure. And I thought that was a huge momentum swing. And then the fact that the Giants, boom, 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 four plays, 77 yards in the touchdown back in front, I thought was really a turning point of the game until the very end and then the Simmons play. Sure. But kudos to uh, Tay Banks for forcing that turnover and kind of stopping any momentum that Seattle was starting to get. Yeah, Bob, I think the the one thing that we're seeing develop before our eyes is a team, we know they're resilient, but their growth 
uh, they're not intimidated. Um, you know, if you looked at the football game against the Detroit Lions in the way it was a fast break offense of game and nobody could stop anybody, you think, wow, this defense is going to have its hands full. You got young defensive backs and Kenneth Walker running all over the place and Smith and Jigba and, and DK Metcalf. They were just having their way. And they came out with a game plan and they executed. No game has been too big for them uh, on the defensive side. And offensively, listen, to go into Seattle, crowd noise, 12th man, and to operate the way they did, they didn't have a procedural penalty the entire game. Um, now, running the football certainly quiets that crowd down, which is, it, it just speaks volumes to, again, their toughness, uh, their resiliency. But listen, this is a team that is not intimidated. And they come out, they have a good game plan, and they execute it for the most part. And, you know, the fact that they didn't score more points um, is because they didn't they didn't pay attention to detail in terms of catching footballs. Um, this is, you know, I, I don't know, you, you can't call it a turning point victory. I think these guys realize, though, when they do the things they're supposed to, they'll win football games. But I don't, you know, again, I'm not trying to be a wet blanket here to these wide receivers, but this is, this is, more important than they realize. And I know they it's important to them. But if you are trending of dropping balls every game, what inevitably happens is that when you need a catch, you won't come up with it. That's the part you so you have to develop the great habits. Um, and I, I love these basketball analogies, is because you know, when you can't make a free throw when it's not important. Just imagine when it is important. If you're inconsistent with certain things that your job description requires you do, you can't predict when you're going to drop one. Game may be on the line. And because you trend towards dropping footballs, it may happen when the team needs you most. So, Get in, you know, prioritize it. That's all I, I, I'm i going to say, but it is important. Your offense is running, you know, really well. And these things are really the things that are preventing you from, you know, serving notice on the league that, hey, look, don't talk, don't, don't talk, don't slander us. We, we're pretty good and we execute good and we're going to be a handful for anybody that plays us. Uh, I'm going to give you another Tay Banks appreciation because after the Slayton touchdown, Seattle gets the ball and they're driving it downfield. And they're moving the ball pretty easily against the Giants. And they have a third and seven at the Giant 29. And Geno's going to go to DK on a little in cut or hook route or whatever. Wasn't the best thrown ball, but the coverage was excellent. Banks gets the pass defended, and it forces Seattle to kick a field goal. So rather than maybe tying the game up at 17, you know, they hold new field goal at 17 to three. And then the Giants go on another one of these drives uh, that stalls, but they wind up getting points. You know, they move the ball enough in which, yeah, you want to see some more touchdowns, but, you know, they end the third quarter up by seven as opposed to only up by four. And then we got to talk about Brian Burns, Carl, um, because hmm. Seattle's going for it on fourth down and he comes screaming in off the edge. I, they had Charbonnet in motion and Walker. My guess is Gina wanted to throw a flat route to them with Charbonnet as a lead blocker, but anything else that they had, um, down the field was covered great yeah. by the Giants. Mm -hmm. He had no place to go. Not that he had a chance anyway, because Burns is flying in on that fourth down play. But, you know, you, you're just really impressive with they made so many good defensive plays when it mattered mm -hmm. um, that 
you know, it was really a, a tremendous team effort. Yeah. Again, the best players have to be the best players. Um, and they made plays. Um, their best players made plays all game. Dexter Lawrence was as disruptive as any uh, defensive tackle uh, in the game yesterday. Um, you know, there, and I know fans are in the moment, and for whatever the reasons they are, um, you go from Shane Bourne not being a very good um, defensive coordinator because he's been but don't break, to now, you know, you have a team that leads the league in sacks. Um, they are limiting points scored. And, you know, I, I don't think anybody still feels the same way they felt a couple weeks ago about Shane Bowen. And it's not because Shane Bowen listened to you as fans. Is that Shane Bowen is a professional football coach, a defensive coordinator who's pretty good at his job. And he has a game plan and he will adjust accordingly. His profile is not what you see uh, in one game. His profile is his body of work. And, you know, again, fans are in the moment and that's your prerogative, right? And if you feel like somebody sucks that day, go for it. But that doesn't define the body of work or who that person, whether it's player or coach. So um, you see what Shane Bowen brings to the table. And even, you know, I posted something about because people were, were crapping on Brian Burns. Opportunities are there some games, some they're not. Don't throw the money part. He's paid like X, Y, and Z, so he should be doing it. That's only in video games, folks. The other people get paid too. When the opportunities are there for these players to make plays, they do that. Um, it's, you know, when I'm talking about their, your best players, right? There was, you know, so much about Burns after the Dallas game. And then, you know, nobody looks to see, well, you know, quarterback had the ball two seconds and ball's out, right? And they they were legislating against, you know, a pass rush. And if a team is leading the league in sacks, it stands to reason that the opponent is going to do everything they can for those guys not to have sacks. So, um, but kudos to the coaching staff and the way the players prepared. Um, and they just have to keep going, just keep stacking. I'm so proud of Cordell Flott um, because he is he is literally locked in, man. And if he can, can just continue to, to uh, do what he's been doing these last three weeks, he's, you know, he's on route to being a really, really good football player for the Giants. So we're on the team charter last night. I don't know. We landed like 2 a.m. or 2.10 or whatever. Mm -hmm. Took the bus back to the facility. I crashed in the players' lounge um, to be here for this morning. You know what's really kind of helping me, Carl? Ah, My Cherubundi. There you go. Cherubundi. So what is, Cherub what is Cherubundi, right? Nearly 500 collegiate and professional sports teams use it. Every NFL team has it in their facility. Ten of the last Super Bowl champions, every NCAA football and basketball national champion since 2007. So I love tart cherries. So this is like right up my alley. Tart cherries are the highest antioxidant fruit or vegetable in the world. So it reduces soreness, helps your recovery, helps your immune system, supports your immunity system, and it definitely helps improve sleep. So it's all natural. No sugars added. Tart cherry. You can get it and mix it yourself with the powdered version, or I have a little, a little bottle of it right here. But like sleeping on a chair in the player's lounge, coming off that <laughs> long flight, this is certainly helping the soreness that I feel in my right hip right now because mm -hmm. that was not a comfortable sleep. So I take the shots. I, I'm I'm a I like tart cherry, but I'll take the shots. I don't sip it. I just shoot it. You know, they have the little shot packages, and that's what I go with. Available on Amazon, cherubundi.com.
retailers nationwide. You can find it in Publix and in Kroger. And if it's in professional locker rooms and all the NFL teams have it, then, uh, you know, it's clean. It's good for you. It's There's nothing in it because Lord knows the NFL has some pretty strict policies of what goes in products. Yeah. So uh, you can find Cherub Bundy in every NFL locker room or at your Publix, Kroger, or go to Amazon and get yourself some. And it is certainly well needed right now. I want to talk a little bit about Daniel Jones. Um, and look, over his last four games, we all know that he was bad in week one. Bad. But since then, Carl, Played well, definitely played well enough to lead the Giants to victory in Washington. Mm -hmm. Could have played a little bit better with some of the deep shots, but still played well against Dallas. Mm -hmm. You know, in the last four games, his completion percentage is 68%. He's averaging 238 yards a game. He's got six touchdown passes. The one interception was the Hail Mary at the end of the game. And his quarterback rating, his passer rating over that period, these last four games, is 99.3. And if you think back to last year at this time, through five games, what the Giants looked like and what they looked like through the first five games this year, two and three could easily be three and two or even could be four and one. Any team can say that, right? Mm -hmm. But what we're seeing is we're seeing a team getting better and I'm fascinated to see as he's developed a little bit more comfort level in the pocket and is spreading the ball around a little bit more. I mean, think about all the throws to Eric Gray early in the game. Sure. And Wandell sure. with the touchdown catch and then feeding the rock to Slayton. The, look, the tight end, Theo Johnson, he had more catches and more yards yesterday than he had the first four games of the season combined. So he's mixing in these other pieces, which is why having a running game is so important. It'll be interesting to see when Neighbors comes back, reintegrating him into it. Maybe Jones will feel less pressure to try to get him the ball, get him the ball, get him the ball, because other guys are doing some stuff with the ball too. And it only is going to make Neighbors even more explosive as long as these sure. other guys are involved in the act. Well, what it what that does the absence of neighbors, um, it it shows the opponents that the Giants have weapons beyond neighbors, and they also have a plan that should neighbors not be in the game, they still have a plan to distribute the football and to get it done. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm really not going to say anything about Daniel Jones because I think his play is speaking for itself. And I think that's a that's a tribute to the work that he puts in every week um, and the fact that he's willing to improve from week to week. You know, um, it was big thing about his deep, deep throws um, in the short memories. Again, people are in the moment, so they saw what they saw. And they didn't want to look at his body of work in terms of his ability to hit those deep shots. Um, but he went back, he got it calibrated. And it was just a matter of, of trusting his mechanics. And you could see the improvement from one week to the next. So listen, I'm going to, you know, just let Daniel Jones's play speak for itself. And the guys around him, his supporting cast is, is doing their job, which is enabling him to really operate. I, I wish he wouldn't take so many hits and I wish he would slide a little more um, because he's taking some shots and, you know, you're a big quarterback and people want to come and smack you when you take off, but uh, just, you know, protect yourself more and, and let that, let that be what it, what it is. But, you know, um, the criticisms of what he can't do are slowly being uh, disproven. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing for everybody. You know, even if you don't like Daniel Jones, um, it's a good thing that he's playing well. Simple as that. You know, um, the Giants did something yesterday that they haven't done in 10 years. Think about this. 
This was the first time that the Giants had a quarterback with a passer rating in a game over 100, a player with 100 and more rushing yards, and a player with 100 or more receiving yards in the same game. Passer rating of over 100, a rusher over 100, and a receiver, receiver. over 100. Mm -hmm. So you got to go back to week 16 of 2014 at St. Louis. Remember that oh. wild game where there was the fight with Odell on the sideline? Yeah. You know, they were cheap shotting him and all that other mm -hmm. stuff. Eli Manning had a passer rating that day of 148.8 in the Giants' 37-27 win against St. Louis at St. Louis. Andre Williams had 110 yards rushing. Bet you nobody had that as part of the equation. Odell had 148 yards receiving. And Ruben Randall was known for his drops over the years. He had 132 yards receiving. So it's been 10 years since they had a quarterback with a hundred plus passer rating, a running back over a hundred yards and a receiver over a hundred yards in the same game since 2014. Mm -hmm. You know, Howard Cross brought something up. I, I meant to ask Daniel Jones this. I haven't seen him yet today, but I got to ask him about this. Do you think his, so I know as a kid playing baseball and, softball and everything else as I got older. I would either slide head first or when I slid feet first, I always slid off my right knee. And I used to like watch mm -hmm. baseball games sometimes and I'd see guys go in a second, slide their right knee, and then, you know, maybe they were sliding into home on the same inning or whatever, and I'd see sometimes guys would slide with their left knee. So I used to try to slide with my left knee. And I can never really do it. Mm -hmm. And Howard Cross made the point. He wonders if Jones isn't sliding is because Jones is not confident in sliding on the surgically repaired knee. I, it's, I, just, it's a guess. I would like, yeah, but I would liken that to uh, the same theory on the, the, the deep ball because he did slide at the end of the game. He, he put a perfect slide in at the end of the game. I just think he has to get comfortable doing it. Um, he's awkward, um, kind of like Eli Manning was. It's just They just crumble to the ground, um, and they just got to get used to it. It's it's repetition um, because he did. He did slide um, in the fourth quarter close to the end of the game. So he he's capable of doing it. Um, it's just a matter of him you know, either getting confident in doing it or making it reflexive. But he's, you know, big athletic kid who thinks he can get more yards, you know, if he stays up. But he can also get more hits when you stay up. Anything else of a takeaway? I guess we gotta we gotta give a shout out here to Isaiah Simmons and the fact that he didn't play oh, absolutely. a single didn't play a single defensive snap. They saw something in Seattle's kick operation. Dable talked about it after the game. Uh Coach Gobriel had something in and Dable kept asking, do we, do we try it now? Do we, and he said, just wait, let's just wait, let's just wait, but it's there. And I guess as they were watching the other field goal attempts, it kind of reinforced that mm -hmm. whatever their flaw is mm -hmm. that coach had uncovered during the week. And it's like, okay, now's the time to break it out because they're about to kick a field goal to send the game to overtime. Yeah. And, you know, look, Simmons, I'm sure he was disappointed not playing at all on defense because the guy wants to play. Yeah. But the fact that Dable talked about how he was working on his get offs on the sideline and he was emotionally engaged and he was mentally engaged and he got a chance to make a play and he took advantage of the one chance in the game that he had to make a play. Yeah. And he made it. It was play. the biggest, it was the biggest play of the game. And it was so interesting, folks, if you go back and look at that field goal block, part of the operation required Nacho to not pull the, the guy who goes low, but just to put his hands on it, which is legal. Um, you look at this clip, and it's just amazing, because as soon as Nacho put his hands on the defensive back, he turned around as if he was Steph Curry 
who shot the shot and knew it was going in. He never saw the block, but if you look at it, he holds the defender down, I mean, the offensive lineman down, and then he turns around and faces the opposite direction and does this. So they were so confident that this play was going to work that he didn't even look. He did his part, and he knew that the rest was going to take care of itself. Um, last thing, though, um, Jalen Hyatt. People are still saying, Jalen Hyatt, why didn't they target on the ball? He's going to stay. It's going to come for him. But he did draw two holding calls. So he did contribute. And maybe if he wasn't held, those would have been his targets. So well, one, you know, I know I know one of them for certain. He was going to be the target because Jones mm -hmm. loved that matchup in that spot. And he was looking right in his direction and then didn't throw it because he saw he was being held and then went somewhere else with the ball because he didn't want to potentially put mm -hmm. the ball in harm's way. So yeah, I agree with you. He's going to be okay. Um, his is again from everything I hear, his attitude is great, um, and it's going to come. He's he's going to be a big contributor, and again, he did contribute um, yesterday. He, he drew two penalties, and the only reason you throw you drawing penalties on defenders is because you're getting open. So that yeah, I, I, is I, positive. I, when you and I walked down. You headed toward the bus. I had to use the bathroom, so I went into the locker room. And it's before they had opened the locker room up to the media, so guys were having fun. They are still getting their pads off. And Dave's, I think, I think he was on his way to his post-game presser, or he was coming back from it. I think he was on his way to it. Yeah, because if he was coming back from it, the locker room would have been open. And, you know, everybody's smiling and having a good time. And he went right over to Hyatt. Mm -hmm. And he said a couple of things to him. They were joking around. They were laughing whatever so you know the perception of maybe him not getting a lot of targets and he doesn't have any catches yet or whatever internally everybody's on the same page with this stuff and mm -hmm. he did contribute you're 100 right two holding calls that he drew turned out to factors in the game because free five yards and one of them i think came on third down which created yeah. an automatic first down mm -hmm. so, so it's going to come I'm, I'm, if he, he just, he just keeps doing what he's doing. Everything I hear about him is he's positive. He works hard. He's energetic. And he, he, you know, it's a close knit wide receiver group. They love working with each other and they love each other. So it's going it, to, it's going to work out for him. See the thing where Wandell and a bunch of guys were celebrating in the locker room and he created a live stream. Yeah. And then Dave will walk by and he's like, what the hell? And he immediately, yeah. sorry, sir. And he yeah. turned it off. <laughs> Abruptly cut it off. That, um, that won't happen again. So, I mean, you know, I, I took Deontay Banks to task on that after the Washington game last year. Um, it's just, it's it's dangerous and you're violating your own space. You know, as 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 players, I know it's, it's fun and we're in a new era of, uh, you know, uh, social media and, and popularity and things of that nature, but understand not everybody is happy for you. And somebody's going to look for something in that video clip or want to hear something in one of these video clips, keep your space sacred, you know, after the game, do those live streams on the field, maybe, but in the locker room, that's your sacred space. You don't want people peering into the privacy of what you guys what you guys do because sometimes things are said in the background ambient noise or even you know in the background of a video something's there and you don't you don't want that to happen yeah or or somebody who doesn't realize the stream is going on they're saying something yeah, correct. that becomes part of this live stream and then you just you potentially could have compromised the teammate yeah exactly so anyway uh, anything else that you have after this? That's all I got, man. That's all I got. They're um, playing well. They just got to start stacking. They know what it feels like to win in a hard fought battle. Yeah, now they got to get over this whole prime time thing. But uh, they got a they got a Cincinnati team that looks like they lost their starting corner, Dax Hill, for the year with an ACL. They're not playing good defensively. Dangerous, obviously, offensively. We'll get into all of it later in yeah. the week with the preview, but. You know, get over this primetime thing, stack another win, and keep figuring out ways to try to win games. Because I, I feel yeah. like 
feel like there's a lot more to this team than we've seen in the first four week in the first five weeks, but I feel like the last four weeks are a little glimpse into what some of their upside could be. Sure. And uh we'll see if they can get a win. All right. How do you like to end it, Carl? Tell a friend to tell a friend. Believe, Believe in, in Giants. Giants.